During the summer of 1967, Dr. James E. MacDonald conducted a series of interviews in Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. These interviews had nothing to do with his official field of study, which was meteorology. They had to do with something Dr. MacDonald found much more interesting than weather patterns and atmospherics. In fact, many years before, in 1954, he had his own strange encounter with something he couldn't explain. This encounter fueled a passion that would consume him for the rest of his life, at first quietly and later openly. What Dr. MacDonald encountered was a strange light in the sky that neither he nor his two traveling companions could identify, and that was late one night in an Arizona desert. So, in 1967, he traveled to Australia to better understand another encounter. This is that story. Took me a while to see it. That grey against the uh, coming on to autumn, blue grey sky. I couldn't uh, see it immediately. So the one saying, "It's there, you blind." So uh, I finally picked up what they were looking at. Uh, was it quite small in size? Uh, it was. Well, when I said, "Well, the only thing I've got to compare it against is uh, later on there were some small aircraft, Cessna size aircraft." Uh, it was approximately two-thirds the length of one of those. It's How far away were they? That kind of makes the difference. Yes, of course it does. Now, they were about... Uh, oh, when, when they were there, when they were well, there, it was, they, they were sort of circling it. The person you just heard talking into Dr. McDonald's microphone is Andrew Greenwood. Mr. Greenwood was a science teacher at Westall High School. The events he's describing... They happened on Wednesday, April 6, 1966, which was a little over a year prior to his interview with Dr. McDonald. That April morning started out as any other school day. There were classes to conduct and sporting events to administer to. Mr. Greenwood had been teaching science that morning, which was usual, when at around 11 a.m. a student burst into the room. Being that he was in the middle of a class, his first inclination was to ask the girl to leave. But what she told him next caused him and everyone else in the class to pause what they were doing. There's a flying saucer outside! By the time he'd made his way outside, he'd realized that the girl hadn't been alone. It appeared that half of the student body, which was approximately 300 students in his recollection, were already outside and looking toward the power lines. As he'd stated in his interview, he couldn't see what they were looking at at first. The sky was gray and overcast on that April morning, and the thing they were pointing at was at least a half a mile away. And then, he saw it. It was silver gray in color, which explains why he didn't see it at first, and it was nothing like he had ever seen before or since. He was no stranger to seeing aircraft in the sky either. The airport was about three miles away, and planes often passed overhead. But this wasn't an airplane. The term flying saucer had been around for some years and was often used to describe an unidentified object in the sky. But this is exactly what it appeared to be. It was later to be described as a cup turned upside down on a saucer. At first, when Mr. Greenwood stepped out into the cool morning air, it was hovering near the power lines. And then it began to approach the school before performing some odd maneuvers which seemed to make it disappear, only to reappear in another spot in the sky. It would stop, drop, and shoot straight up before hovering again. A helicopter, perhaps? Of course not. A weather balloon, as would be suggested later? Witnesses would counter, if you've ever seen a weather balloon, you've certainly never seen it perform maneuvers like that. And don't forget, this wasn't a handful of witnesses. It was half the student body watching this strange object as it drew closer to the school. After 20 minutes of this, the object began to descend behind a line of pine trees. 
into what was then called the Grange. Knowing that an open field lay in that area, many of the students rushed to catch a glimpse of it and watch it land. Before this could happen, the object again shot up straight into the sky and began to accelerate. That's when the planes appeared. Five of them to be exact. It looked like the planes were actually pursuing the object in a game of cat and mouse. They would get close, the object would take off, only to stop again. The planes would approach, and it would rapidly move away before pausing to hover, only to repeat the process all over again. Finally, those within the object must have grown tired of the game they were playing, because it then accelerated at a rapid pace upwards into the clouds and disappeared. The show was over. Over the next few days, the headmaster of the school declared the entire ordeal to be a lot of nonsense, and he actually forbade anyone from speaking about it again. So what happened in the days following the events of that morning? Did headlines around the world announce that up to 300 people watched an unidentified object descend from the skies over Melbourne? Did the Air Force bemoan the fact that their jets couldn't track it, and that it seemed to play games with them before gathering speed and disappearing? No. As far as those five planes were concerned, according to the RAAF, they never dispatched any aircraft, nor were they aware that there had been any objects at all in the area. Not that it appeared on radar, anyway. The ever-present weather balloon theory was floated, pun fully intended. Two and a half hours before the UFO appeared over Westall High, a weather balloon had been launched into winds that might have blown it toward the school. For proponents of that theory, the supposition there is that the balloon would also have to have defied a few laws of physics once it showed up, shooting up into the sky at a rapid pace being one of them. Another theory suggested that it might have been a nylon windsock that is sometimes used by military aircraft during training maneuvers. However, the RAAF had denied having any aircraft in the air, so that takes the wind out of that theory. Experimental aircraft? Perhaps. That is always a possibility where many unexplained sightings are concerned. Whether or not this is the case is a matter of conjecture as no aircraft like the one seen that day has been seen or unveiled since then. There's also the purported landing when the object first descended behind the stand of trees near the school. Now some witness accounts mention that a large round area of grass had been flattened into swirly patterns, swirly being their word and not mine. Two separate investigations were conducted by interested UFO groups that operated in the area at the time, those being the Victorian Flying Saucer Research Centre and Phenomena Research Australia. Both came away with very little in the way of evidence, other than eyewitness reports, but those reports were credible and consistent enough to leave them scratching their heads, and wondering exactly what it is that they did see. It has been said that four people from the Air Force did in fact arrive three days later to poke around the field the object was said to have landed in. Now what became of that is anyone's guess as no official report or dismissals were ever released. When all is said and done, we are left with a number of unanswered questions about that day. But one thing is undisputable. Something was seen. And it was seen by at least half the student body and some faculty. Not one person said it looked like a balloon or that it might have been a windsock dragged by a plane. Any difference in the reports concerning the object's appearance seemed to rotate around the color of the thing. It was said to have been silvery gray, while some also said it had a purplish hue to it. If the surface was reflective, this might have to do with the cloud cover or the low cloud cover in the overcast skies. But there I'm only speculating. And that's all we can do at this point, is speculate, given the lack of any reports from official bodies or evidence in support of the event. What we can say is that the children who'd witnessed the craft were asked not to talk about it, and that the school actively discouraged them from being interviewed. Now, this wasn't the result of a cover-up. The headmaster said so afterwards, but it was to prevent the students from being distracted from what they were there to do, and that was to learn. It's a fair statement. So what did happen a little over 50 years ago in the skies above Westall High? The most likely answer is, we'll never know. Cases like these with multiple witnesses who report seeing the same thing are rare and special. Unfortunately, the inability to understand or interpret what they have seen in these cases isn't so rare. For centuries, a person or a group of people have pointed to the skies and asked, what's that? 
What is that? Sometimes it's a comet, the planet Venus, or yes, even a balloon. Other times, well, it's a strange encounter with the unknown. Thank you for listening. Now, if you haven't already, please subscribe and leave a review. It will help the show. And you can also help support the show by going to strangeencounters.org. I would really like to hear your suggestions for future episodes as well. And if you've had a strange encounter with something unusual or paranormal, I would love to hear it. Visit the contact page for information on submitting your story. And until next time, please take care of yourself. It's a strange world out there. Good night. I'm the